finishing up each mission can bring a man to grief. Oh, we are the bomb group, tired and blue. We wish our flying days were through. But now we've got a mission according to the boot. So we sit in our very fine airplane, constructed of paper and wood. It's okay for lug and cheap whiskey, but for combat it just ain't no good. And if you should get in a pickle and don't know the right way to turn, that's when you reach up on the dashboard, push a button, mark, spin, crash, and burn. Early in the morning when the engines start to roar, you can see the old girl standing in the operation. He'll be sweating out the takeoff as he always has before. Safe behind his armor plate at desk. Take him off, take him off, take him off. You can hear him in the briefing as he stands back in the rear. Though the runway's sucked in solid, still the target may be clear. You've been here for 20 months, boys, but you've got another year. Says the man behind the armor plate at desk. Take him off, take him off, take him off. When the lead ship starts to shudder and the end seems close at hand, who is flying on the sofa with his headset on command? Who yells, climb up on top, boys, with a highball in his hands? The man behind the armor played a desk. Take him off, take him off, take him off. Four times he's let us up there and he's always let us back. For he'd circle o'er the IP as we went into attack. He says, I'm hard yet fair, men, but allergic to ack ack. The man behind the armor played a desk. When our mission days are over and we all go up the drain, you can look around the airfield, but your search will be in vain. For oh, we all will be in London getting drunk and raising pain, like the man behind the armor played a desk.
and the deeds of those brave people in the occupied countries. Ralph was shot down himself on the 5th of January 1944 and was with the French underground for roughly two and a half months until the British sailed him out back to England. But Ralph will tell you his own tale. Ralph, the stage is yours. I hope you can all hear me. Yeah. It's a privilege for me to present this story to you today, and I'm happy to see it's such a large group that is in attendance. We do have an interesting story, but first I have the privilege and the honor of introducing some guests that have seen fit to favor us with their presence today. In the front row, we have a dear friend of AFES and a dear friend of the 8th Air Force Historical Society, who helped, helped over 100 uh, American airmen while she lived in Belgium. I'd like to introduce Madame Anne, Madame, Madame Anne Brusselmans, who now lives in Florida and, and in Georgia, and Brusselmans, who I think was she helped are in the audience. And in addition, of course, but without, uh, uh, I don't want to have uh, Yvonne feel neglected. I would like her daughter, Yvonne Daly, who gave up her bed to all these visiting airmen when she was 14 years of age. Yvonne Russellman's Daly. privileged to have in the audience uh, six Belgians who are on a visit to the United States, courtesy of Leland Smith over in Lexington. And I would introduce, like to introduce to you uh, Piet and Brigitte Dauté. Piet's father, Joseph, was a member of the Secret Army Belge, and he helped American flyers to escape, but he was executed by the Germans. Piet and Brigitte Dauté. Marcel was a member of the Secret Army Belge. He helped flyers to escape, and he also was executed by the Germans. Paul and Francois Wendell. In addition, we have Raoul and Maria Stayart, who from Belgium, and Raoul was a member of the Secret Army Belge. que vous êtes ici, que vous êtes parmi nous aujourd'hui. Bienvenue à Bon Séjour. In addition, we're very fortunate to have with us a man that has helped me in putting together this program, a chap uh, who was a member of the intelligence service in the United States Air Forces in Europe, born in Sweden, came to the United States at 17. I'd like to introduce Colonel Stone Christopher. We have another friend in the audience who is, was uh, married to one of our panelists, and I'd like to introduce Colonel Roger Files, who was a fighter pilot, but fortunately or unfortunately not with the 8th Air Force. Colonel Files. <laughs> We have a pretty good attendance from APs, uh, our APs members uh, present, and I'd like the APs members present and all evaders, whether or not members of APs, all evaders, please stand up. <coughs> We couldn't come up with anything that was suitable. 
So the Air Force's Escape and Evasion Society was formed in 1964. As a result, 30, a meeting of 35 American airmen who had been shot down in Western France and came out by means of Operation Bonaparte. Of course, at the time, we didn't know anything about what Operation Bonaparte was, but we knew a couple of the leaders. And we invited the leaders of the Réseau to from Buffalo, New York in 1964. On the left is uh, Rimmel Radio Operator. We're, you're losing me, or I'm losing you? Okay, the, la the lady is Anita Lemonnier, who was an interrogator, spoke fluent English, she lived in Paris, she interrogated all airmen coming through the Shelburne line. The little chap in the middle is Captain Lucien Dumay, who was a sergeant major in the Fusiliers Montréal, and uh, was captured at Dieppe, escaped, and got back to England, volunteered to go back into France to set up Réseau Shelburne. The man on the right is Mathieu de Branchou, who was a resistance leader, a World War I veteran, and he organized the resistance in the town of Gangol in western France. The, eighth, the first, the outgrowth of that meeting was the was AVs, the Air Force Escape and Evasion Society, whose raison d'etre is to let the people that risk their lives to help us know that we have not forgotten what they did. This pin is a lapel pin presented to all bona fide helpers, and unfortunately it's difficult to read, but it says, we will never forget. And that is the slogan, and that is the uh, we, the reason we exist. We present certificates of appreciation to the helpers each and every day somebody deserving comes out of the woodwork and we send them certificates. Every year we send over 600 Christmas cards to our helpers overseas. We three times a year publish a newsletter and uh, have a meeting uh, every year Union. in uh, one of our ceremonies we presented a plaque on the Plage Bonaparte, where we departed from France in 1944. This says, we the 94 American aviators who embarked for England from this beach on the dark nights of 1944, say to our friends of Réseau Shelburne, we will never forget. Again, advancing the theme. This was a monument, of a marker that the, I had the pleasure of dedicating to my three crewmen who were killed near the village of Kevries below in western France. We had in 1976, we had 72 Frenchmen to the White House uh, to, to, for a visit. And in 1978, we had uh, 34 Dutch helpers to a uh, visit with President Carter at that time. In addition, we had a big ceremony at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier where two very fine Dutch helpers presented a wreath in memory of the Unknown Soldiers. This has been a slogan. We've passed out thousands of these buttons in Western France and throughout Paris, from Paris all the way west. This is when it all started, and I'm sure all of you remember the day in 1941 when things hit the fan and your life was changed forever. It, I was a young man of 21. I was healthy, I was single, and I was a pretty good draft bait. So in April of 42, I enlisted in the U.S. Army Air Forces, ended up as a cadet. In, uh, my first airplane ride was in Sykeston, Missouri, in a PT-19. I graduated after 60 hours to Coffeyville, Kansas, where I flew BT-13. So on the to Aldous, Oklahoma for AT-17 training in 18 a few hours in an AT-9. When we graduated from Aldous, we were sent to Pio, Texas for B-26 training. The only B-26s they ever saw down there had four engines and were made by Boeing. <laughs> so I ended up as a co-pilot on the B-17 of the 94th Bomb Group, 331st Squadron, going overseas in October of 1943 with the Glenn Johnson crew, crew number 38 of the Reeves Provisional Group. We started flying combat missions in October of 1943, and on the 5th of January 1944, we bombed the airfield uh, at Marignac, which was about 40 miles east of Bordeaux. And uh, over the target, we were attacked by ME-109 fighters that put holes in our horizontal stabilizer, the right horizontal stabilizer, and the big vertical stabilizer. We were unable to keep pace with the formation, going back up over the Bay of Biscay, and right smack dab in the middle of the Britain Peninsula, we had an attack by uh, FW-190s flying out of Lorient. We did very well in evading their attacks for two passes, 
and we tried to turn slowly and change altitude up and down, and the first two passes were not very fruitful. But then we found we were headed directly back into France, and that didn't seem like a very good idea either. So we gave it a pretty good 90 degree turn, and at that point the attack came through and the entire tail assembly of the airplane came off. So we bailed out as best we could. Three of our men were not able to make it. And two weeks later, my mother got this telegram. I don't know whether it's legible or not. But in any event, many of you have these and have seen them. Uh, the airplane landed in a hedgerow in uh, western France, burned for days. The Germans came and the three bodies that were in the plane were uh, taken and given a decent barrel in the countryside. I landed next to this hedgerow and my parachute uh, collapsed around me and I immediately took off towards this farmhouse to try to see if I could uh, communicate with anybody. And they obviously <coughs> spoke no English. As a matter of fact, I'm not even sure they spoke French. This was in a small Breton community where the tongue was Breton. The old people spoke no French. But in any event, when I couldn't communicate with them, I turned around and immediately saw my first pilot, my bombardier, coming up across the field. So the three of us took off, hid into the woods, tried to dispose of what things we had that we thought the Germans might find of interest or that might be uh, might precipitate uh, questions that we didn't want to answer. So then we walked for the about uh, uh, till that evening and we came uh, uh, across the home of uh, Lucien Garand and Lucien uh, spoke no English. He invited us into his home, fed us some hot soup and then took us out to a neighbor to put us up for the night. So we went to the uh, neighbor house, Albert Demont, and Albert put us up in a nice soft bed. So our first night in France, we slept in a very beautiful bed uh, with feather bowls, or feather, uh, what am I trying to think of? Magic. Feather comforters. So then the next morning, he turned us loose. He didn't know what to do with us. He said, head in a certain direction. So we went across country until we came to the town of uh, Warak. And uh, we slept in a haystack that night, and then the next morning we're walking down the road and two figures popped up out of the ditch. We thought, God, they were German for sure, but they turned out to have been our waste gunner and the navigator from another crew. So now we're alive. Five of us are wandering around in uniform, violating all the rules that we've been learned to handle. Truly across the country, we went across the canal, German observation post was on a hill across the canal and then uh, took off again at night, walking in the curfew, and we came to the town of Pure. We came in from the upper right, and we were smart enough to think you don't go walking through town at high noon. So we walked around the town to the left, and we came out on the road at the lower corner, the lower left-hand corner of the screen, and we looked back up the road, and there's a schoolboy standing in the middle of the road. We said, oh, God, what do we do now? So we knew that he had seen us. We paused for about two or three minutes, and finally, the hell with it, and away we went. We went walking down the road. But what had happened is the schoolboy went back to school, and uh, he was late. And the teacher wanted to know, you know, what's going on here? How come you were late coming back? He said he had seen five American soldiers in the road. <laughs> well, you know, this blew Tony's mind. And Tony turned her class over to uh, Monsieur Daniel, chap we call Mr. Chips, and she came looking for us. And she found us out hiding in a field where some other Frenchman had taken us. And this Frenchman had taken us into a bistro with the largest wine barrels I'd ever seen in my life. At least six feet tall. And we, they fed us wine and they had hot soup for us. We didn't know and we didn't care. We didn't in any event, Tony came with her friends that night and they took us back to the schoolhouse, all five of us now. Well, she couldn't, couldn't put up five in the schoolhouse, so two of them went with uh, Marcel and uh, with Josephine on the left. Josephine lived in a home next to the school, and her parents, this, were, were her parents, uh, she lived with her parents, and she brought these two airmen in to sleep in this house. So at night, two of, the, uh, two of us stayed in the schoolhouse, two of us came to this house, and one of them went with Marcel, who was the other chap in that picture, who's now Josephine's husband, but they were affianced at the time. So Marcel lived across the street, and it was the damnedest circus you ever saw at night. All these three guys would leave the school, and then in the morning they had to get back. Well, there was hell to pay when it snowed one night, and all the footprints were in the snow. <laughs> but we would go out to 
This was a little store where they found provisions for us and they provided us with uh, some, provided the school teacher with some food to feed us. This was a picture of me and Mr. Danielle, Mr. Chips, taken outside the schoolhouse door. Uh, we were trying to get a photograph for my false identity card. Mr. Danielle, Mr. Chips was killed by the Germans four days before the liberation of their town. Oh. They made, while we were in hold up, they had to make false identity cards for us. And this was my false identity, identity card. I was Rani Payi. I was a traveling salesman, but I was also a mute. Now, <laughs> zone around the coast. These are the, some of the cards. They stole all the damn rubber stamps they could find in the various mayories and in the offices and so forth. And this, after the uh, liberation, they made a, uh, they took all these rubber stamps and made a composite of it. So that's what they have there. All the time we're hiding here, five weeks now, five of us are in this neighborhood of the schoolhouse. And the Germans are posting the warning signs. Warning. Ailey's is warning all persons of the masculine sex who wave directly or indirectly the crews of an aircraft coming down in parachute or making a forced landing or hiding them in any manner will be shot in the field. And the other one that said the women who render the same type of aid will be sent to concentration camps in Germany. And I didn't realize the word concentration camp was I thought maybe we had originated as a derogatory term, but it apparently has other meaning. But these supporting signs were posted all throughout the occupied country. A bit of passive resistance that always just tickled the hell out of me. I would see that they gave me these uh, French uh, 20 franc notes, and they would cut the head of Hitler out of a postage stamp, and then put it in, cut a little slit in the rope, and insert it in the rope, and then circulate it. And I had, I brought this one back with me, and I know another evader who has one also, so it, is, it was something that was not uncommon. And while, while we were in hiding, some of you guys were up there dropping letters and, and uh, newspapers to them, and uh, here they're saying the RAF and, and the USF can't hear you. The RAF and the USAF dropped over 6,000 tons of bombs uh, in, the, in the lower there. In two years, the 8th U.S. Air Force has shot down 3,385 German aircraft. So we, uh, or we, we had our own propaganda. We were trying to communicate to the French uh, what was going on in the real world. After five weeks, wiser heads prevailed. They decided that it was stupid and risky to, for us to be holed up in this same village. So they split us up, and two of us went to the little bistro about two and a half miles down the road. I stayed in this place for two weeks with another chap, and very seldom ever got out of the house. After two weeks, then we were moved. Well, this was the owner of the bar. This is uh, uh, Jean Villalot on the right, his wife Francine. They had been married. I think about two weeks when I arrived there, and my friend arrived, and her sister, Yvonne, they were the ones that kept us there for the two-week period. So after that time, we moved again to the Hotel Tour de Bride, and we stayed on the third floor of the hotel, uh, courtesy of the manager, Joseph and Alice Guyen. Joseph had been in the Merchant Marine, had been to the United States several times, spoke very little English, if any, and was sympathetic to the cause, and therefore sheltered us. Two more weeks in the hotel, they decided to move us again, and we went to the town of Langanet, where Ilya Jomain met us, and then he escorted us out into the country to a small farmhouse inhabited by a little old lady and her two sons. And this is Louis Lenoir, and his son Baptiste had been waiters down in Grenoble in a very high-class joint. Now they were hiding out in the country to keep from being sent to, the Germ to Germany as a forced laborer. This is their mother. She was 94 years of age at the time. I, I just love this picture. I think it's a classic. <laughs> then we were taken to a little truck came to pick us up after the fourth day by Michel Lecrenne, who was a barber in the village of uh, Gorin, and we missed the train. So we're, he's got five of us finally, and in gathering us together, we were separated. Uh, he couldn't find some of us, so we missed the train that day. He had to put us up overnight. Fortunately, we got a haircut on. 
<laughs> then we got on the train the second day and we rode to the town of Gangnam. Now this is supposedly about an hour's run, but it took us about three hours. The German troops were on the front four or five cars of the train and there was nobody on the back but people that had been in the country scrounging for food. And as we arrived in the town of Gangnam, the railroad station is up at the top of the picture. We were met by a guy with a newspaper under his arm. We followed him down the street and he took us to the home of the gendarme, M. Chevron. And M. Chevron's house was just down the street from German headquarters. German headquarters was in the break of the wall up on there on the left. We would sit in the window above the garage and watch the German troops going by. And for two days we were there until people came. That one night, Francois Calderon came in his little gasogen, which was a charcoal burning truck that rigged up. It was a regular truck rigged up to burn charcoal. They came and they listened to the BBC at 7 o'clock. And of course, I, not speaking any French at the time, knew nothing of what they were looking for or what they were saying. But the BBC broadcast a code message. Bonjour à tout le monde de la maison d'Alphonse. Good evening to everyone in the house of Alphonse. This meant that the British motor gunboat had departed from Dartmouth in the southern part of England and was headed across the channel. The mission was on. All systems are go. So with Francois was uh, Georges Lecune, who was part of the resistance in Gangnam. And we then uh, Francois took us by truck about 25 kilometers to the town of Plua. And here Francois Leconnec was the chief of the Rizzo in, in the Brittany, and uh, he was under the direction of Lucien Dumay, the Canadian officer. And one of the workers in this group was Maria Teresa Le Calvé, who was a tireless worker. She escorted the airmen to the beach. She met them at the railroad station. She fed them in her home, kept them with her. She and her mother, I think, sheltered about 20 airmen in her home. This is Jean Jacquel. Now Jean Jacquel was a small, was a, had a small farm right near the coast. And Jean and his wife, <coughs> this was the last meeting place of the airmen. And when I went through there, there were 26 of us departing that coast. And we all met in La Maison d'Alphonse. There are no pictures of it. The Germans burned it down because they assumed that there was some activity going on. They couldn't hang anybody with it, so they just burned the place down. Outside the Maison d'Alphonse, there was a field, and Joe Bengui, who had been a naval, or he had been a merchant marine captain, Joe and his friend Pierre Huet spent two days on their hands and knees searching out the mines on the path between the Maison d'Alphonse and the beach. They had all the mines located, they put little sticks there, there were 19 of them. And when they would go out at night on a mission, they'd put white handkerchiefs there so that those of us who were following knew where the mines were. When we had departed, they would come back and pick up the handkerchiefs. And every time they'd go out, they'd put out 19 handkerchiefs, and they'd come back, and they'd make sure they'd pick up 19. I was just in France two weeks ago, and they told me the story that after the liberation, they brought German prisoners of war in to dig up the mines. They dug up 20. <laughs> This was the beautiful beach in western France where the motor gunboat came in to pick us up. This is the cliff that we all came down and we sat on the rocks on the right hand side of the picture looking out to the ocean, no moon, no stars, pitch black, German coastal defense batteries on either side, and when the batteries opened fire it was like daylight and we thought sure as hell that they'd sunk our boat out there. But no, after about three hours the boat finally came, little rowboats came in on the swell, and we climbed on board. The British sailors rowed us out about uh, a mile or so of the sea to pick up MGB 503. And the 503 boat was the one used in most of these missions, and it uh, was a high-speed boat, pretty well armed, and en route back to England we ran into six German e-boats, and the guy said, to come up, we, we were all below deck. And they said, well, come on up, we want to see a good show up here. We had the hell with that noise. <laughs> so we outran or out evaded the German e-boats, and four hours later we ended up in the town of Dartmouth in southern England, safe and sound. Now, when we got back, we started to learn a little bit about what happened. We had a picture taken of the five of us. How did that happen? <laughs> in, the, in any event, these are the five that were together. We came out on separate nights. Two came out in uh, uh, March uh, 18th, two on March 20th, and 
one, I think, later. So we did all get out. But then my mother received a telegram at, at that after uh, I had been back in England two weeks, and all they knew was I was back on duty, back on active duty. Big deal. Everybody was thrilled to know that. <laughs> I found out that we had been in the hands of Rezo Shelburne. And I also found out that Rezo Shelburne was headed by Lucien Dumay, Sergeant Major, Fusiliers Montréal, and he had been captured at Dieppe, got off the, uh, jumped off the train, made his way to southern France, and was and escaped from southern France by the uh, Paroliri escape line. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Second in command was Raymond Bras, who was a radio operator. Raymond Bras had been in France earlier as part of the Val Williams line, and that was compromised, and he had to flee out of France uh, over the Pyrenees Mountains, came back into England, volunteered to go back into France to help set up Rezo Chalbert, which turned out to be the most successful operation of its kind of World War II. They never lost an agent, and they never lost a package. MI-9 was the vehicle behind all of this. We didn't know it at the time, but this was Brigadier Norman Crockett, who was in charge of all the E&E uh, &E operations. They set up things. He was ably assisted by a chap by the name of Ari Neve, who became a member of Parliament and a member of Margaret Thatcher's government, and the lost his life in a bomb in the parking garage of the Parliament. In addition to that, was Jimmy Langley, who lost an arm at Dunkirk, and he wanted to stay in the Army, stayed in the intelligence service and worked in setting up MI-9. And the American intelligence sections worked with MI-9, and perhaps Dorothy Smith will tell you more about that later. But in anything, there was the Pat O'Leary line. Pat O'Leary was a doctor, and uh, he lived in the south of France and operated. Well, he was sort of commissioned as a first lieutenant in the Royal Navy, and so he operated the, the trawler, the Tirana, which came out towards Marseille and uh, brought a lot of uh, airmen out by the southern coast of France by sea, which was early on in the war. So Pat O'Leary turned out to be Major General Albert Garis of the Belgian Medical Corps. He has since died within the last three or four years. Then there was the Val Williams line. This was under the direction of uh, Vladimir Boryashkin, uh, and the line was broken in June of 43 when its leader and a party of airmen were arrested near Paul in the shadow of the Pyrenees Mountains. Raymond Labrosse was second in command. Uh, he was in Paris when he learned that his leader, Val Williams, had been arrested, and with the help of the Burgundy Line, he returned to England, and then six months later, he came back to France as second in command. This is Val, Val Williams, or Vladimir Boryoskin. He was a, a Russian Jew, born in the United States. So it was a great basketball player. Then there was a Burgundy line. Now, the Burgundy line was under the leadership of Georges Brossi, a free French officer. And they successfully evacuated 225 men over the Pyrenees through Andorra into Spain. This was the Georges Brossi, uh, Drew Tartare, was an American uh, movie star in Paris, and when the Germans took over, she decided to stay, and she worked with the Burgundy Line. Then there was the Dutch Paris Network, and I think you might hear more about some of the uh, operations of that later. But this was headed by George, or by uh, John Henry Widener, who worked with the World Council of Churches in uh, Geneva, uh, Dr. Mr. Hoff, and he, uh, this is our Panelist, Dr. Gabriel Nahas, who was in the uh, Toulouse area and uh, aided airmen that came down that way. Gilbert Beaujolais was in Paris and uh, there were several other people in the Paris. The evasion of airmen from the south part of France took many routes. One of them was through the little country of Andorra. The Comet Line, everybody knows about because of Madame Anne Brusselmans and of course some of our visits uh, by members of the Comet Line to uh, some of our meetings, for example, in uh, Cincinnati. But this was headed at uh, later date. It was founded uh, by uh, uh, Dating's father, <coughs> Arnold Dupay, and when that line was compromised, Dede took over and became the celebrated hero of the Comet Line, the Petit Cyclone, Dede de Jean. In the south was Francois, Jean-Francois Notham Franco was his code name. 
Franco operated uh, as the anchor point of the combat line coming from the Belgian down through Paris down into the south of France. Then they had uh, Florentino was the vast guide that was used to a great extent by the combat line. Florentino knew the paths over the mountains and he led many an aviator over the mountains, perhaps somebody in this room, I don't know. This was the rugged Pyrenees Mountains that these guys had to navigate at one time or another. I hope somebody will tell you more about the perils of the crap crossing these mountains into Spain. This was a group of airmen that got caught going to cross in the spring before the snows had melted that much. They had to go past German observation points, cross raging rivers in the springtime. Several people were lost in the rivers when they couldn't hold their footing. This was Donald Darling in the, the uh, British intelligence aid in, in Gibraltar. So those that got into Spain had to make contact through the embassies and the, through the agents in uh, Spain, and they eventually ended up in Gibraltar to get back to England. <coughs> this was not without cost. These, you, these are a, a list of some of the comment line members who were lost to the German Gestapo or the SS. Many, many books have been written about escape and evasion. And I'm just going to show you a few of them. This is Jimmy Langan's book. This was a Women in the Resistance was a book that AFES cooperated with, the doc, with Dr. Rossiter for several years in publishing this book. We wanted to ensure that the women of the resistance got their proper due. And this is before we learned to not be male chauvinists. This book tells its own story. This is a book by Harry Dolph, the editor of our Atheist Newsletter. This is by your, your own uh, Jack Elfrey, who is a member of the Board of Directors of the 8th Air Force Historical Society. This is a book that was written by Madame M. Russellman many moons ago. She probably surprised that I have it, but I do. And she is rewriting it, so stand by for a great public announcement. This is the book by Clayton David, who is now president of AFES and who will be a member of your panel very shortly here, as soon as I shut up. And last but not least, this is a book by Yvonne de Ritter Files, and by sheerest of coincidence, Art Swanson has a few of them at the PX that he'd be very happy to sell you, and Yvonne might be very happy to sit there and autograph them for you this afternoon, sometime, or tomorrow. So that's the story of Ralph Patton AVs, escape and evasion, and now we should get to the interesting part of the program, and uh, we would like to have the lights back, back on, if you please. of only four living survivors out of 300. Charlotte, Charlotte Mamba. I would now like to ask Yvonne de Ritter Files uh, to come up, please. Yvonne now lives in Topanga, California. Yvonne de Ritter joined the resistance in Antwerp, Belgium in February 1944, 1941, I'm sorry working as a secretary and as a courier for the General Sabotage Group of Belgium, known as Group G. She later was involved in sabotaging German vehicles and distributing mimeographed underground publications. She started providing shelter to evading Allied airmen in the spring of 1943. Arrested by the SS in late 1944, she was sentenced to be hanged. She was freed when the advancing Allied armies liberated Antwerp. Yvonne de Ritter Files, now living in Englewood, New Jersey, is a Kentucky colonel appointed by the governor of Kentucky several years ago. All you Kentuckians, salute your colonel. Dr. Dahas would probably rather be talking about his current war. 
He is one of the world's authorities on the effects of the drug culture and the effect of drugs on the human body. He feels that this war he's fighting is very important for our children and our grandchildren. But during the war, he was operating in the region of Toulouse, France. He started working with the resistance in 1941 by printing and distributing a clandestine newspaper. He was arrested in December 1941 and held for two months. He was released for lack of proof, but from May of 43, he worked with the Dutch Paris Line evacuating Dutch and Belgian officers from Switzerland into Spain. After November 1943 until June 1944, he was involved in organizing convoys of airmen out of Toulouse into Spain. He also worked with, the Francois, with Francois de Sartes, who had taken over after the arrest of Pat O'Leary and the Pat O'Leary Line. They were helping British and American airmen to evade capture. His citation for the Medal of Freedom with Gold Palm reads, he was responsible for the escape into Spain of more than 200 Allied evaders and for the organization of a vast underground escape net which aided the U.S. in the war against the enemy. Dr. Gabriel Nahas. <laughs> he used to call him Big George. But anyhow, his name is Hank H-E-N-K-E. Little George. But he won't, oh, he won't, uh, he won't uh, acknowledge if you call him Hank. But George Van Remmerden worked with the Dutch underground in the Biesbach. He helped the evaders uh, avoid being captured there, and the, the, primarily started out helping the Jewish people that were hunted by the Germans. The Biesbach is a 100-mile square watershed, a shapeless swamp feeding the Merwave River in the southwestern Holland. Only the area natives knew their way through this swampy maze. The Germans patrolled major waterways, but hesitated to travel the back channels frequented by the underground. He commanded a small group of resistance fighters uh, who scrounged food from black marketeers and collaborating farmers. He was active with explosives and was sabotaging German facilities. George Van Remmerden. <laughs> President of the APs right now. He's from Hannibal, Missouri. He was a co-pilot with the 303rd Bomb Group. He was shot down on January the 11th, 1944, over Holland. He traveled from Amsterdam to Maastricht, to Brussels, to Paris, to Toulouse, and he crossed over the Pyrenees Mountains and eventually ended up in Pamplona, Spain. After traveling by car to Madrid, he was put on a train to Gibraltar. Returned to England by C-47 on 25 May, 1944. Clayton C. Davis. Mr. Lee Gordon. I never knew his name was Lee, but Shorty Gordon, come on up. Shorty now lives in Australia, and he came here for this symposium, and he's going back within a few days. But Shorty was a gunner with the 305th Bomb Group. He was shot down on the 26th of February, 19. 1943 near Willemshaven. He was taken prisoner and sent to Dulag Luft, then to Stalag 8B, Stalag 7A, 5A, 5B. <laughs> After two unsuccessful escape attempts, he succeeded on the third try, and he traveled by train across Germany into France, made contact with the underground in France, and escaped by way of Réseau Schelber's Operation Bonaparte. Shorty Gordon is, to our knowledge, the only American airman ever to escape from a German POW camp in Germany and return to England prior to D-Day. Shorty George, from San Antonio, Texas. He's a rated officer, but he was acting in the command capacity when he fly, flying a mission on the 22nd of February, 1944. He flew with the 303rd Bomb Group, and he landed near Duffel, Belgium, and made his way to Switzerland. He escaped back into France, intending to cross the Pyrenees into Spain. Established contact with a French resistance group at Avignon in southeast central France, and he organized a battalion of Maquis who were primarily engaged in interdiction of railroads and bombing of railroads. He remained with the Maquis until September 1944 when the U.S. 7th Army 
liberated the area. George, Colonel George Weinbrenner spent his career with the intelligence service, retired several years ago as a full colonel. Now I'd like Dorothy Smith Hunty to come up. Dorothy Smith was a WAC captain in the intelligence service in England. Many of our members met her during the war and were interrogated by her. She has a lot of interesting things to tell us. Captain Smith was located in PW and X headquarters on, on Brook Street at the end of the war, was responsible for interrogating a number of evading, evading airmen. After the liberation of Paris, she moved to Paris to help organize the recognition and the awarding of medals to deserving members of the underground who helped America's airmen. Dorothy Smith Hunty. Dorothy. Anyway, a song that she knew the Dutchman knew also. 
And all of a sudden, out of the bush, bush on the side of the road that was dark already, he came back to say, Vessel. And she found the guy up there, that way, and brought him back to the way, to the place where he was supposed to go. So it was quite an exciting story. Well, we had many of them, but I got only five minutes, so. Thank you, George Van Remmerden. Actually, he didn't even have his five minutes, but all the same, good tale, and I'm sure he'll tell us more later on. Now let's go to the other end of the spectrum, so to speak, and talk to one of those who escaped. Clayton David, would you like to tell us how you made it home? How many men out there remember 11 January 1944? The raid to Osterschleben, Brunswick, Haberstadt. It was a pretty deadly day. I happened to be a member of the 303rd, that night, we had 109 empty beds in my base. And just to give you a little perspective, and sometimes we had fairly good percentage of people we paid. But when I returned to my base the 25th of May, I was the only man that made it out of 109. The majority, of course, we know later, were killed in action large numbers became prisoners of war. Well, after two and a half hours of constant air battle, we were on our way home, and oh boy, when you begin to get back around the Zyder Z, you got back around Amsterdam, you thought it couldn't be too many more minutes. Well, we had had two engines out, and the number two gas tank on fire, and it began to blaze pretty heavy, and it looked like it was the time to give up the ghost, and we did. I was flying co-pilot, and at 15,000 feet, I bailed out. I am here to tell this story today primarily for the thanksgiving of my helpers, and also to those unsung heroes like the paratrooper who came to our base and told us what to expect on bailout, on our very first bailout. Well, to make a long story short on this, I was the only man in our crew that landed on land. There was a 30-yard strip that existed between the Zyder Z and Kingsmere Lake. I had calculated that the cloud cover was at about 3,000 feet, and that's what we were flying above. And so I decided I would wait till I went into the clouds to open my parachute, and I did. When I opened my parachute, I immediately bounced out well, at the bottom, and I had less than 500 feet of sea. But I looked, and I could see nothing but water, and finally, on a second look, I could see a little strip of land. And that was the side of the deck of the Zyder Sea, and a little pathway along Kingsmere Lake. A paratrooper had said that when you want to go some direction, pull the shroud lines on that side. I did. It was my one and only jump, and it was letter perfect. Yes. Now, I, I don't know what happens in some of these things, but I tell you, I heard about some of the comments of those of us who went to war and so on. But if you've never found God, I think you will in critical conditions. I don't know what happened, but as quick as I began to get out of my parachute and throw it into the water, took off my flight boots and filled them with water to sink it and so on, I couldn't see where to go. Here I was on a narrow strip of land. What way do I go? A man came riding by on a bicycle, and he pointed. I went that direction. Having been back there several times since, I'd gone in the opposite direction and I walked right into a little village and been arrested. Now, I don't know where that man came from, but he was there when I needed him. And I hid out in the drainage ditch and until it was dark enough to move, or well, I thought it was, and then I immediately had help from a farm. Now, I'll show you that these things also had uh, parts. I've 
since learned that there were two brothers. One of them was sympathetic to what the Germans were doing. The other one helped me. The other one that was sympathetic ended up in Poland a few weeks later with the German army. When he returned to Holland, he was not welcome, and he shipped off to Brazil. But it was the first night that I found very, very tough, wondering, I knew I was alive, but did my folks, who would get the message? I'm sure it's the thought that's run through the minds of many in this crowd. But anyway, I also was interrogated by a man at this first farmhouse that did a beautiful job. I've sir, since learned that he was a German, he worked for the Reuter News Service, he was a reporter. Living in Holland, he had become impressed with their activities and he became sympathetic to them and he helped uh, me in the interrogation and did a thorough job. Well anyway, I got into the underground organization. They took me into Amsterdam, Amsterdam to Venlo, Venlo to Maastricht, and Maastricht to Brussels, and later Brussels to Paris, and in Paris our group, and incidentally I was on Dr. Nahos's Dutch Paris line into Paris, but the group ahead of me was shot up in the mountains of Toulouse, and we were detained too long, and the people helping us were arrested. And uh, so eight of us, we broke up in pairs. Two, incidentally, out of the eight ended up coming out through Shelbourne. Two of us went across the Pyrenees, the other four, two of which had escaped from the Germans in Holland, ended up going to prison camps. Now, I'm going to tell you a couple of little incidents. I don't know how many of you people were familiar with riding on trains when you were flying. Riding on trains in Europe, I sure didn't. No, I didn't know any better. My first train ride, I was given a ticket, and when I got off uh, the, the train at Venlo, one mile from the German border following my guide, I thought they were looking for passports, and I had a fake passport, and I had it in my pocket. I had never thought about the fact that they'd never picked up my ticket. They think you're honest over there, and you collect that ticket that you get off. And uh, so we were all marching off of the train and turning in the tickets, and I was within five uh, feet, and I saw the man who wasn't taking tickets, and I had my hand on my passport, so what do you do? I just flashed my passport in front of his face and walked right on. He thought I was some member of the Gestapo, I guess, right? <laughs> Uh, but uh, uh, in Paris, we, we had to break up, and uh, with the other man and myself, Ken Shaver from 388 Palms Group, uh, we traveled then into uh, southern France on our own, and we again learned a lot about riding train. It wasn't all successful, but it turned out all right. And we finally ended up in the uh, mountains of central France, where some people helped us, later put us in touch with a group of the Maquis, and we were sent there for a period of time, received uh, parachute drops at night, and then they were distributed in arms and ammunition. Well, when a couple came out to take us into Toulouse on a Sunday afternoon to go to Po the following day, they didn't want us to waste any travel time, so they gave each of us two suitcases. We carried, and I don't think too many did this, we carried two suitcases into Toulouse, <coughs> two apiece, and they were filled with hand grenades, machine guns, whatever ammunition and so forth that was to be distributed. So that turned out to be a little interesting experience. Uh, the, uh, uh, then we went to, uh, to Po, and Poe went out into the mountains and had a uh, fast guide. And of course, that's the forbidden zone that you got into out there. The only people that had a right to be in the zone lived in the zone, and that was the treacherous area. I've since learned there were four of us crossed together, and that composition of four was Ken Chaver, the airman, was with me, a French courier who had been dropped in, made his delivery and his contacts, walked through the mountains into Spain, back to 
back to England, uh, and he was on his third trip. Uh, the fourth person was a Spanish deserter from the Civil War who had hidden out in France and was on his way back to, uh, to Spain, and he paid his own way. And uh, so it was kind of a, an interesting tie-in. I have since learned that of those of us who made it to the foot of the Pyrenees, which we thought was quite an achievement, that there was somewhere between <coughs> one half and two thirds of us that got through into Spain. The rest either were captured or something happened to them. And some good percentage just were not physically able to make it and gave it. I ran over, excuse me. Thank you, Clay, very much. Now we'll turn to this charming lady on my right, Yvonne de Ryder Files, and learn how she came so close to death in Belgium all those years ago. Yvonne. Ladies and gentlemen, before anything else, let me tell you, gentlemen of the 8th Air Force, that the sight of you squadron after squadron of bombers flying high up in the sky over my home in Antwerp, Belgium, on their way to bomb Germany, filled me with such excitement and feeling of gratefulness toward you. Give it to them, boys. Give it to them, was our cry. My husband, Lieutenant Colonel Roger Files, U.S. Air Force career officer, fighter pilot, now retired, who is here with me, is not as so many assume, one of those I hid in my home in Antwerp. <laughs> no, he didn't fly out of England. He was fighting in the Mediterranean theater and earned many medals, including the Silver Star. I was involved, as you've heard, since January 1941 in espionage, then sabotage, as a member of the General Sabotage Group of Belgium, known as Group G storing and delivering explosives to the men whenever and wherever they were needed. You can easily imagine that I had several close calls. But the biggest thrill in my three and a half years of resistance work was in the last year, sheltering Allied airmen. The first delivery consisted of two Royal Air Force and one Royal Canadian Air Force. <coughs> Now, before I go any further, it is important I give you a sketch of my location. My apartment was on the top floor of a three-story home, one block away from three connecting magnificent park, a beautiful residential area on the outskirts of Antwerp. Now, the Germans thought so too, judging by the fact that they occupied many of the big apartment houses all around me. So, the coming and going of the Luftwaffe personnel was constant on the sidewalk below. I have a photo I treasure and which is reproduced in my book, which shows my three first evaders standing at my picture window watching from behind the curtains the Luftwaffe personnel on that sidewalk. The second flyboys entrusted to my care consisted of one New Zealander RAF fighter pilot Max McGregor, and Lou Rabinovitz of New York, U.S. Air Force. Two magnificent subjects for a study in differing human characteristics. <laughs> <laughs> Max McGregor, very reserved, little shy maybe, perfect gentleman. Lou, the typical New Yorker, I guess, <laughs> extrovert. Joe, he was a riot. During his day, he brought me the most laughter of my four years of German occupation. Of course, another joy was my reunion with Lou 11 years later in February 1955 on the This Is Your Life show. Ralph Edwards, the producer, had read an article relating the ceremony at the British Consulate General where I was awarded the King's Medal for Courage in the Cause of Freedom bestowed upon me by the Queen. He immediately had sprung into action, and three weeks later, under a false pretense, here I was at the El Capitan Theater in Hollywood, taken out of the audience, brought on stage. Ralph Edwards 
brought on as surprises on the show three of the airmen I have sheltered, among them Lou Rabinovich. There were, of course, unusually exciting moments, too. For instance, when, to calm the nerves of two evaders who had been stopped by the Gestapo and asked for their identity papers just as they drove into my street, I took them that evening for a walk through the park. As I mentioned before, these parks were just one short block from my apartment. By the way, these two men, in addition to the anxiety of the encounter with the Gestapo at my corner had in the shelter where they came from somewhere in Brussels, been obliged for five days to remain locked up in one room, forbidden to move around, and could only speak in a whisper. So you can imagine their nerves were understandably quite raw. Now picture us three walking arm in arm down the narrow park lane and constantly crossing paths with Luftwaffe personnel who greeted us with good Abend, good Abend, as they passed by. Well, we three returned the courtesy with our own good Abend. The comic of the situation brought laughter to the boys and a return to a comparative comfort. The day I was notified by a breathless resistance emissary that I had been betrayed and that, quote, they would come to arrest me in an hour, I had five airmen in my home. <coughs> I have only five minutes, so can't go into it here. It is all detailed, of course, in my book. But as you can imagine, this was one of my most dramatic moments. I don't think the shock here was even surpassed by the one the day of my actual arrest. Several weeks later, after having been in hiding, the Germans did catch up with me, and I was arrested. I was placed in solitary confinement, but taken out daily for interrogation. <coughs> no need for me to go into details about these. You have read many accounts of them. I was condemned to be hanged, but thanks to the swift advance of the Allied forces was liberated ten days before the execution day, giving me the pleasure of being here with you today. Thank you. What a marvelous lady. Now we'll go to the other side again to somebody who was a member of the U.S. Air Force, U.S. Forces in this case, George Weinberger. Once again, I apologize if my pronunciation is not quite as you would wish, but George, tell us your experiences in those long gone days. Uh, thank you very much, Rob. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm certainly honored to be here, and like my friend Clayton, my main purpose in accepting was to give public thanks and public recognition. Closer? Okay. To give public recognition to the French and the Belgian people who are responsible for my being able to be here today with you. Uh, like our friend here on the right, uh, I got shot down on the way back from Ogersleben. Shot down over in Belgium. I spent only one night in Belgium. Belgian people were very, very kind and got me out of Belgium very, very quickly into France. I had a little bit of uh, advantage because I spoke quite good French at that time, still do, and a little bit of German. And like our good friend here, Stone Christopher, without him we wouldn't have had any escape organization on the American side. But he was very, very good in following the advantage of the, uh, the British did at AI-9. He kept the thing going. Uh, I got into Paris, France, all right. February of 44, and things were very, very rough there. The, the Germans were getting quite beastly, quite nervous about the in oncoming invasion. They knew it. And uh, so it was very, very dangerous in there. I'd like to recall just one story to show the type of people that the French people were there. Uh, I was getting pretty hungry and pretty cold. I took a chance and I saw a gendarme, an old man, and he had on his lapel the ribbons of World War I. So I went up to him and I told him I was an American. I was hungry. He looked at me. 
He said, follow me. I didn't know whether he would take me to the police station or the Germans. But no, he took me to an old flat, took me upstairs. His wife was there. They fed me what they could. And uh, she took some warm water and washed up my feet, which were almost freezing. And after I was feeling a little bit I said to him, you know, you took a terrible chance. I could have been a German, posing. And he said, yes, you could. But if we'd have found out later that you actually were an American, and we had refused you with help, we would have died of embarrassment. <laughs> that was the type of people we had. Well, here I got. I was able to get on a train, and I went down to the Swiss frontier, and uh, knowing the language, and having toured the country before the war, I got into Switzerland, all right, and I got on a telephone from the local priest and called the U.S. Embassy in Bern. Boy, I thought, I got it made. And I talked to a young attaché at the embassy, and I told him who I was, and uh, I said, come and get me. And he said, you were instructed to go to the Swiss police, turn yourself in, and you'll be interned at Montreux for the rest of the war. I didn't believe what I was hearing. <laughs> so I, I told him in under certain words that what I thought of his ancestry. <laughs> <laughs> turned around, talked to this old uh, Swiss priest, and I said, I'm going to head back and try to get to the Pyrenees. And he said, God bless you, son. I don't think you'll make it, but you ought to try. <laughs> so went back, and sure enough, on the way back into France, the French police picked me up. And uh, they were curious as all hell about me. And uh, they uh, threw me in a, a dungeon. I was in that damn thing for about, uh, about a week. But they were feeding me for pretty well. And I thought, oh, oh there's something wrong here. See? And uh, kept telling them that I was an American. So they didn't believe that. But they fed me pretty well. And they took my shoes away. <laughs> I thought you'd take, go out the layup. And uh, finally, on the seventh or eighth day, a young Frenchman came in dressed in the uniform of the Alpine Chasseurs, he was a lieutenant. And he asked me a few questions, and I answered correctly, and he stood up and saluted and said, Welcome to France. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, things were getting still worse, so I was advised by this lieutenant to try to head for the center, center of France, where Clayton was there. And I, I did, I went down to the Auvergne, right at the Massif Central, and I thought I'd run into a lot of resistance people. Well, unfortunately, uh, in that mountainous region, they weren't very, very well organized. And uh, I had no trouble getting food or getting help for any of the local people, primarily farm people, peasants. But there was no organizing at all. One day, I got a message from one of the Frenchmen, and he said, there is a, either a British or an American up in the next village, East Warren, not too far from here. And I said, you sure he's British or American? He said, we don't know. So I went up, and uh, outside of the little beach where it was, I listened to him speaking. And he was speaking French, but, but sure as hell wasn't a, uh, an Englishman. At least it didn't sound like it. And uh, sure enough, when the guy came out, I grabbed him. And it turned out to be an OSS officer by the name of René Dussac. He was killed later. And uh, he was an Argentine serving in the U.S. OSS. So uh, I asked him if he could get a message back to uh, England for me. And he said, yes. He said, I, I can uh, talk to Allied Force headquarters. And all I wanted to do was let my mother and father know I was safe. And about three days later, he came to me and said, here's the message. And said, you are instructed to remain in situ, render assistance, and organize the local Mackie. I said, oh, oh, well, it's an official order. That was it. And a few days later, they brought a, a Britisher to it. You saw his picture tonight, Ralph had it, Harry Nee. And he was one of the heroes of heroes. And I talked with him for a while, and he said, oh, yes, you've got to organize this Mackey. So I did the best, best I can. And here's the remainder of what I have from Mackey. I had a, a uniform for the French Foreign Legion. <laughs> and I still use this cap when I go to France fairly frequently. I leave it at the top of my suitcase. And the French customs, when they open it up, they see that, they salute. <laughs> Anyhow, we did try to organize a, a, a Mackey battalion, and because of my language ability, 
uh, they were able to get them together. These were farm boys, two factions, the FFI, the French, these were the, the Dugalist boys, the other were the FTD, the communists, but there was very little difference between any of them because they were just local kids. We had no ammunition, we had practically nothing, but it was a, that area of France, there was a lot of mining going on, coal mining and whatnot, so we could get explosives. We could steal ammunition uh, from the, the Germans and from the French uh, police, the French police, things like that. And so we were able to do, do something. Now Ralph had asked me to talk about the resupply of the Mackey by the uh, 8th Air Force. Well, unfortunately, the area I was in, we didn't get any, nothing. But uh, in this month's uh, magazine, which you all have gotten, there is an article on the carpet baggers. It's pretty well done. And uh, they talk in this article about the Battle of the Margarine in central France. Well, I had my battalion in that battle, and they suggested this thing that the, we lost the battle because uh, they, they were betrayed, the French were betrayed. Uh, I don't think that actually was the case, although I can't document it. I think the Germans were highly, highly efficient in their intelligence. They knew what was coming. They brought in there a, what the French called a division blonde, armored division of Lapid SS. And boy, oh boy, those are real SOBs. And they were terrible, terrible. So they shot up everything. So we had to speed it up. But anyhow, I had to scatter my unit. And by that time, getting close to September, the French B Army and the, uh, the Seventh Army, Sixth Army, were coming up the Rhone Valley, and I finally was able to join them in the, just outside of Lyon, France, and uh, was able to get back to uh, to England uh, through a circuitous route. I didn't have the pleasure of being interrogated with this lovely lady here. They, I guess they thought I wasn't worth it. <laughs> that was it. But uh, I would like to uh, just make one comment. Uh, the French and the British people and the Belgian people that helped me and helped others, uh, unbelievable. And uh, I would be very, very proud if under similar circumstances, our people would act the same way. I think they would. Thank you. Thank you, George. You mentioned interrogation, so let's turn now to Dorothy Smith and Keith. Can you tell us what it was like dealing with these young men when they returned to England? What did you learn and how did they behave? What it was like was exciting and very pleasant. And I, I, I feel dreadful being here, having lived a very safe, comfortable life all during the war. I started out with no one knowing why on earth I was there. Uh, I never worked for a newspaper, and everybody who was going over in this group had worked for a newspaper. I did speak some French, and I had gone to school in Europe, and nobody thought that was very important. And I found out toward the end of the war that of the five people he chose, I was one of the two that he got. Uh, I got there and went to work reorganizing the file. I'd been trained as a company commander, and the office was in chaos. And I put that in order and found all the correspondence with French underground. So I translated that and turned that in. And uh, we got casualty lists every day, the day after. Very garbled lists. And Major Nelson would look at them and he said, finally, we didn't know what to do with him. And finally, he started throwing them across the table at me and saying, you have to organize things. Do what you want with these. I didn't know what to do with them. But it was the Air Force that had gone down the day before. So I saw them, they went off to pay, play darts before lunch, and I don't play darts. I, I, as a tribute to the boys, I started reading these lists aloud every day as a tribute to them as best I could, because it was a real mess. Smith would be spelled with two Q's and a Z. And at the end, it, out, it, it, it was really uh, awful. But in the end, from those, I had a phenomenal memory, which I no longer have at that time. And I used to have, I, I, I'd say to the boys, I have an advantage over you, I have feminine intuition. And it was very good at somehow or other deciphering those lists. Whenever they were, there was any message about any of the uh, men who were down or they were coming back and they wanted identification as to whether or not 
they were Americans or, or, or Germans and that sort of thing. That list became absolutely invaluable because I could look at a bunch of Q's and Z's and I don't know how. I could say, sure, look, this is this, don't you see how this whole crew fits together? They went down together on that date. And they were ours. And twice I had to make the decision about uh, whether they, they were Americans or Germans with absolutely nothing but the first one, no, because they'd gone down in North Africa, so nobody, they, they came from North Africa, they'd gone down in South France, so nobody in England knew anything about them. But I'd been struck by the fact that I didn't know anything about the outfit when, when the casualty list had come through. And uh, one of the names, which turned out not to be garbled, I thought was the most garbled of all, but I used to repeat them aloud to myself, you see. So when these came through, that these were not Americans, I was able to one screech and say, hold everything, these are Americans, I know that they are. They flew out of North Africa, and they were. And last night, Mrs. David was able to, to let me know that their pilot was a member of the organization here. Uh, the, uh, the other time when I just did it, I'm lucky in a prayer. I couldn't see how I could have all of those names almost right there together. But every time that they, the, the people in France thought they were Germans, and every time uh, that we'd tell them, ask them what they had for breakfast, because we knew exactly what they'd had for breakfast. They would always come back with the wrong answer, and they refused to change it. You couldn't convince them to. And I finally decided it was the right answer. And it was. A girlfriend had given them eggs, and they were the only ones in the outfit who had eggs for breakfast. But they thought we were very smart and intelligent, so we knew that they had eggs for breakfast, and that's the answer we wanted. It was not. But it worked. <laughs> so that first half of, of the war was spent on interrogation. The second half, we went over to France, and it was to decide on um, what uh, recognition and compensation was to be given. And uh, they were going to try to, some people didn't want money, they had lots, but some people had suffered great hardships when they weren't in an organized line, you see, that could get money and that sort of thing. Also, what are we going to do for decorations? The French can give the Légion d'honneur a teach civil so civilians can get it. And in England, they have the king's orders. We had military decorations, period. So think of the Air Force each year when the president gives out the Medal of Freedom. The Medal of Freedom and the Eisenhower Certificate of Appreciation came out of our office in France, working that out. And that was done so this country now has a decoration we can give for valor to civilians. And, and that was done. And that was, in many ways, maybe the most interesting thing. I had a lot of fun because we divided France into territories, and I got Brittany. And Brittany, the terrain, lends itself to a lot of fighting, and there's a tremendous amount of resistance there. And, of course, sheltering right now. I've been on that, uh, that um, cliff that you showed the picture of. That was the only time... When, when I first went to Brittany, I, I went into the bus and I said, I don't own any slacks. Slacks came with our uniform. And I know that my French officer at number always wears slacks. He said, walk around my desk. So I walked around and he said, stick to your skirt. And the only time I regretted it was when I went down that cliff. <laughs> the only time I ever needed it that I did that. But it was wonderful and what was so fantastic at the, at the end of the war when... Uh, the Americans liberated Dachau, that so many of the top people in the resistance who were still alive had survived the heartbreak of, of the um, of the December when the Germans broke through. The Battle of the Bulge. Because it looked as though they were in, invincible, and a lot of people, like my future husband, had seen all the crops lined up in England, and, and some of them even had a hard time getting, getting through the disappointment of that. But when we liberated Dachau, you know what all those prominent resistors had to do was to escape from the Americans because they had typhoid and we quarantined them. And they all knew that if they lived there, if they stayed there, they'd die. They all went out back under the fence and they came to us in Paris. And so many of the people who had fighting spirit did live through 
It, it was fantastic. And it was time for people to get awards and decorations and get married and go home. It's the end of the world for me. Thank you, Dorothy. Now we'll go back to France again to Dr. Gabrielle Nahas. Would you like to tell us your part in those difficult dark days? <clears throat> My friends from the mighty 8th Air Force. About 50 years ago, I was a second year medical student in Toulouse, France. As a medical student, I was not drafted as all the fellows of my age. As, as a medical student, I was not drafted as all the fellows of my age who were sent to work in German factories or had to go into hiding. Toulouse is 80 miles away from the Pyrenees, the 10,000 feet mountain range between France and Spain. And I knew those mountains well, since mountain climbing was one of my hobbies. The Pyrenees were the main obstacle on the way to North Africa of Gibraltar and England. <coughs> Toulouse, a city of 200,000 at that time, became the transit point of those who wanted to rejoin the Allied fighting forces. First in 1942, it was uh, we were able to guide through familiar mountain passes, a few special agents, and most young Frenchmen who wanted to rejoin in England General de Gaulle. For us it was just a trek of a few days, but we came back. However, starting in 1943, Toulouse became the center of one of the escape routes for the surviving crews of Allied bombers, mostly from the 8th Army Air Force, who had been shot down over occupied Europe. These pilots and airmen who had risked their lives daily to deliver France were for us heroes falling from the skies. An increasing number of them came to a city which was occupied by 20,000 German soldiers, quite apparent everywhere in their green or gray uniforms, and not to mention the hundreds of snooping Gestapo agents and their informers <coughs> impossible to spot. So we had to get organized to assist our heroes. We call them, by the way, our packages for delivery. As a medical student, I pieced together a little group of trusted friends and fellow students most eager to become helper of heroes under the guise of handling packages for special delivery. The young ladies were most adept in this task, probably because they are used to go shopping, and they were also much more numerous in the 18 to 21 age group. Uh, they were not called into service or sent to Germany. And they performed magnificently in our little network of volunteers who worked as tourist guides, conveyors, shoppers, cooks, interrogators, suppliers of food and clothing. I was also in contact with mountain guides with whom I had scaled the Pyrenees and one of my classmates became became for us a full-time guide. His name was Charbonnier. Every two or three weeks, the, <clears throat> the same scenario unfolded. The curtain rose on the arrival in Toulouse of SKPs sent to us and uh, retrieved by word of mouth. They came singly or in groups of four or five from uh, the Dutch Paris or Francois network. And the first act they had to be retrieved and concealed from public view as soon as possible. They were so tall and so poorly closed. You could spot them, you know, <laughs> if you had an eye for them. And they had to be placed in safe locations, often in attics and basements. They had to be fed and clothed, given boots. They also had to be screened for possible moles. And uh, I remember one time there was this uh, so-called French Canadian who came over all alone and uh, I had some uh, second thoughts about him, so I put him with a group of true Americans. They had all, they had bailed out from the same plane and I knew they were, they were uh, safe. And uh, one day I came back and this man had disappeared. Uh, and I understood that uh, he had disappeared in a violent fashion. Uh, I didn't, <laughs> which required, as a matter of fact, the help of the farmer to make them holes. Uh, <laughs> so, but most of the time, it was for the flowers and idle and very tedious wait. Most of them kept quiet. I only heard once of a noisy 
the alt uh, of a noisy altercation. It was in the winter of the ele election year 1943 when a few fellows engaged in a bull session over FDR and they woke up the landlord who saw that the Gestapo were hurrying to enter his house. My friends, you were tall men telling tall jokes. One to be remembered is the tale of the giant flying fortress B-1000, which I didn't see in the maquettes that you have around here. Well, it had the size of an extended 747, and the pilot had to communicate with the tail gunner by dialing long distance. <laughs> On one flight, communications were suddenly broken between the two as the plane started to swerve up and down. The pilot sent a messenger on a motorcycle to the tail gunner. <laughs> Minutes later, the cause of the turmoil was relayed back. A message Schmidt had been caught in the fan of the tail compartment. <laughs> Act two was to locate one of our elusive mountain guides and plan with, with him the safest way to take a convoy of 12 to 15 airmen to the Pyrenees. And we had to settle especially for P, or passage day. Then came Act 3, the assembling of the airmen at the railway station of Toulouse in the evening. They were escorted by conveyors and under the bored gaze of ubiquitous German soldiers, they were everywhere those guys. They boarded overcrowded local trains to one of the small cities which was on the edge of the forbidden zone which Clayton spoke to you about. This was a 15 mile wide strip of mountains stretching parallel to the Pyrenees it was occupied by two divisions of the Wehrmacht and its access was forbidden for anyone not living there. When, SK when SKPs had reached the selected small railroad station at nightfall, they left the train on the wrong side of the tracks. Indeed, our packages were then entrusted uh, to the waiting mountain guides, driving his bicycle all over town, town or taking trains to, be in, to keep in contact with our conveyors, our escorters, our suppliers, our messengers and guards, and also with the guys in the big positions in Switzerland where I had to go also. Because all of the communication had to be made by word of mouth. There was no telephone, no written messages, which made scheduling very difficult, of course, and our convoys, especially uh, their departure. Uh, somewhat uh, erratic. You can imagine what it was when you see uh, the delay that we have on our airplanes today uh, for, for, for leaving sometimes several hours. There, no, it, it didn't go beyond several hours. The scenario I have just described was repeated on the eve of the Allied line landing in Normandy, which I celebrated in Toulouse. But by then, the Gestapo had identified all of the members of our little network and moved in. Six were shot including our guide Chabonnier. As many were imprisoned, I managed to escape, and I'm one of the lucky survivors. But really, I think one should not put the, the shoe on the wrong foot. You were the heroes, because you were able to project a model. It was a model of a country which was fighting for what is right and what is decent. And this is an unending fight. It's today the fight of our children and grandchildren and maybe they should be uh, informed that in order to inherit the freedom of their fathers, they have to stand on the shoulders of their fathers and not step on their toes. Thank you very much. sentiment, true as they come. Now we'll turn to another brave lady from Belgium, Charlotte Ambach. I thought you, you might perhaps be interested in some of the stories with uh, pilots, with, with crewmen that we, uh, I had, some of them that made life more difficult for, uh, for us and some that uh, actually uh, resulted in quite a bit of laughter and fun. And there was one, one story I had to go and fetch some boys at the border of the Dutch-Belgian uh, border and they were, uh, they had been picked up by uh, uh, Dutch people and brought to a baker in Bray and uh, to, in order to get there I had to take 
a train and then a tram and then partly on a bicycle and partly to walk and so on. And when I arrived, there were these four boys who had waited for quite a long time and they gave me an absolutely fabulous, fabulous welcome. They pressed me up on their shoulders and danced around with me and, and they nearly framed me against the ceiling. <laughs> But, um, and then, so the next day we, uh, I, I took them back again, my bicycle, tram, and train to Brussels, and in the train I had them dispersed, and one of them was sitting in a compartment, and uh, I told them, and I passed by and, and uh, uh, blow my nose, you know that you have to get out, that that is, uh, and, uh, when the moment came, the one who was in the compartment, he, w he was fast asleep. <laughs> so I said to another one, I said, can you go and get him? And, and so he went in and tried to wake him, and the, the first one, the, the, the one that was asleep, said, oh, what? <laughs> in English, that was, was not exactly the best, best moment that I passed. I was a little bit uh, afraid that might have bad consequences, but everything went fine. That was one. Uh, we had also a very bad moment at one time that one of the airmen, uh, there were two, who, they were quartered in an apartment, uh, a nurse's apartment in Brussels, and um, uh, they were all alone there. The nurse was, during the day, she, she stayed, stayed away there. She only went once a day. To get, and one of them had started bleeding internally uh, apparently he had either had uh, a, a bleeding ulcer or a stomach rupture when the parachute, opening parachute, uh, jerked him up and, and, and something was wrong with him. We uh, didn't quite know what to do. The nurse, thank goodness, she knew a doctor who actually put himself in double jeopardy. Not only that he was going to, was trying to help in, one of the airmen, but uh, he was also Jewish. So, as I say, he, but, but he went there, he didn't, couldn't do very much for him, he tried to do whatever he could, because operating was, of course, out of the question. And uh, we were not quite sure how well this young man was going to fare or not, and we, of course, had to think of the possibility that he might die, and what then to do with the body. And uh, that was one of the very bad questions, and we just said, well, what we, the only thing what we can do is take him, up, take him out, leave him somewhere in the street, and then go away and let him be found by, because we could not go to authorities or anything to, to tell them about it. But there was also another small incident that was very funny, and that was uh, uh, an American airman who was at least six foot, if not if not more, uh, tall, and he was terribly gung ho. He he was fighting the war and really wanted to show that he was a fighter. And at a certain moment, from our apartment window, he saw two German officers passed by in the street down there. And we had the worst time keeping him from getting out of the apartment, running down and killing these German officers. <laughs> he really wanted to continue the war. We told him that that was not the best idea to, to do it where, where he was at that time. Uh, and the, there was another one and that also was, was very amusing. Uh, Again, we had four boys, and one of them had a fairly big parcel under his arm, wrapped up in brown paper, and uh, he wouldn't let that parcel out of his sight. And he was very worried, and that must have been terribly, terribly precious to him. And finally, we, we were very curious about it, and, and, and finally we couldn't stand it anymore. We asked, but what is in that parcel? He, the farmer who had picked him up had given him some wooden shoes, some gloves, Dutch wooden shoes. <laughs> that was in the past. Uh, 
And then, and this is one of my boys who is sitting right here in the audience, um, I, we had them at the house and I had to convey the four of them to another, to another place where to stay and so on. And we got onto a tram and uh, uh, we're passing the Palais Justice in, in uh, uh, Brussels on the tram and I saw a man who to me seemed suspicious but he seemed to suspect us too and he got off at the Palais de Justice after looking at us fairly disagreeably. And I said to the four boys, out we go, the right, the, stay, the, the stop after that, we went out. And then I took them through all kinds of small streets, so, on, so that we wouldn't be followed uh, in order, and then finally we got onto a tram again and got to, to another, to the, to the destination. That is... Uh, well, I think that is about the stories I have here. And I also want to say there's one sound and one thing that I shall not ever, ever forget. And that is the vroom, vroom, vroom of the fleets of the big bombers coming over. And the gratefulness when we had them, it was like angels flying over. And thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Charlotte, another wonderful lady. And last but not least, to the gentleman on the far left here, who we haven't forgotten, and I think he probably thinks we have, Lee Shorty Gordon, a legend in his own lifetime. <laughs> Well, I want to get right down to it and want you to hear this. Because Dorothy there interrogated me when I got back for two weeks. And she gave up, and I was still talking for another two weeks. So I'm going to really have to cut my five minutes down. I got shot down February 26, 1943, Willem Thompson. Was with another crew. Five got killed. Three of us wounded. All picked the other five. The five of us that lived got picked up right away left right in the middle of Germany. We ended up down to Dulac Look. They interrogated us about a week down there. Then they shipped us out. Well, over to Crompton and boxcars. I said, oh, this is, this is a hell of a way to get to Germany and be a tourist. All the way across to Poland, they threw us in a prison camp up there, Stalag 8B. It was the first, most of them were British out there. At this time, there was only 70 American enlisted men in PW. That's how early in the war it was for us. Because the raid I got shot down was the second raid on Germany proper. Well, I guess they didn't know what to do. They thought we were Indians out there. They were supposed to separate all the nationalities. They, so they put us in with the Hindus for a while. And this was pretty good because those people didn't eat meat and so forth. So we had a little more to eat all the But I want to get it across to you right now. What they think like this Hogan's Heroes? Come on. It was rough. If you had a sawdust sandwich, that was good. And we didn't have any sawdust sandwich. They just give it in big loads to you. Well, they finally decided to ship us out of there and start an American camp. The first uh, camp for enlisted men it was Stalag 7A at Mooseburg. Well, some of them decided to make a break. Well, we didn't know much about it. We figured all we had to do was just get away from the Germans and we were on our way. Ah, that was just a start. Well, we started across Germany. We got over near Czechoslovakia. And the train, with, what happened is they had 50 of us in a boxcar. You ought to try that, 50 guys riding in a boxcar. You sit on top of each other's heads. And they decided they didn't want to let us go out to go to the toilet once in a while. So what would you do? Over your shoulder, right? Ah! It was rough. Let's face it. Well, we didn't like that boxcar so bad, so eight of us decided to make a break. We got the uh, door of the boxcar open when that train was going up, going up a, a steep grade. We jumped off a train. Well, you ought to try to jump off a train going 40 miles an hour. Wow, there was plenty of excitement there. The other fellow was Arnard Schultz from New York. He and I decided to team up, but we started to jump, and there was a big ravine there, so we had to hold up for a minute. This was the middle of the night. Well, eight of us got off there, all right. We didn't get shot. The other guy said, oh, we're going to escape with us. They're liable to shoot us. And they said, well, you got a chance to go with us. Why get shot? 
Well, we got out, we were only walking around here about two days. We didn't know what to do, you know. You just, well, you end up in a foreign country, you can't speak the language, and everything, you think you're going to walk out of the country. But it's six or seven hundred miles across Germany, a long way anyway. Well, we got caught. We were walking through this small town, and the police got us. And one part that I, I do want to take, I want to take a drink of water, but it did make my mouth dry. <laughs> it was plenty dry. The fellow I was with was a Jewish fellow from New York, Bernard Salt. And they got us in this, the German police picked us up first, and they took us into a sort of a Nazi gathering. And they all had their armed bands on with SWAT deacons, and I'm saying to myself, I'm in trouble. And about that time, over in the corner, they were all running in, piling each other like a bunch of idiots. And they took Salt over on the side. The next thing, Salt threw his hands up in his air. And I thought, uh oh, what are they doing with him? They pulled out a Ruger and stuck it in his back. And rump, rump, Salt marched out. Man, my knees are shaking by this time. I figured, whoa, he's going to get it because they looked at our dog tags and saw they were Jewish. And I heard him out say, Jew? That's when he whipped out this revolver. I said, he's first, I'm next. Well, here comes Salt walking back in. And I said, where, where did you go? He said, oh, I had to go to the toilet. And I said, I did too, but I didn't go out. <laughs>
if I could get to Munich, I could meet some people in Munich. I tried it before on the Viking escape also, but I, I couldn't I couldn't speak French, couldn't speak German, I couldn't speak I couldn't even speak English. <laughs> if you can tell. <laughs> so bye guys. I got out of camp again. I, I can't go into how I got out of camp. So I used to just walk in and I like every Hogan Cheryl's huh? Let's face it. Anyway, I got out of camp, got back to, got into Munich. After about two weeks, hiding out in the uh, French commando, they called them people, French people and, and foreign people that had to work for the Germans, they were hiding me out in the barracks. The only interesting thing, one place was raided. I was hanging out with some uh, Yugoslavians, and uh, I was tipped off it was going to be raiding. So they told me, oh, go over to this other barracks, and I had to go over there and sleep with 20 French girls. Oh, wow. <laughs> I got, I rose trained out into France. When I got into France, I hit the French underground, and uh, it was pretty exciting. I had a lot of exciting times in France there. I started out once in January of, uh, of 1944. I started out in a uh, operation run by a French fellow called Monsieur Paul Fon. Well, it was about, oh, I think there was only about four or five of us uh, Americans and British on the boat. And we're heading back to England. We got into rough seas, beat the planking out of the boat. We ended up back in France. <laughs> Some of the fellows got caught. It wasn't so good for Monsieur Fonfon. They got shot. And I was again ready to lose. I worked my way back to Paris. I was staying with a doctor and Madame Bourjou, which unfortunately they were both caught. And she died. So here I was again. I got hooked up with Marcel Coma. I was working for uh, Operation Shelburne, and I went out the same way. I met the month of head of uh, Ralph there, and got back to England. Before we open the meeting for questions, I'm going to go back to George Van Remenden because we did only give him four minutes and he tells me that he has another amusing tale. So, George, if you can tell us uh, a fairly short amusing tale of your experiences, we're very pleased to listen. Uh, I hope you remember my little story, how we took the people out of that hospital in Utrecht and one day we took the wrong road and ended up on the main road to Arnhem. So I made it back, we found the Dutchman again, but to prove how lucky we were, Sometimes, not only guts and not only intelligence or whatever it was, but it needed it to get away with the things we did. The next day I found out that on the way, on the road, we took no way to, through the uh, farmland, the Germans that day had a checkpoint. And everybody that we by there were checked. So if we hadn't got lost in Utah that day, I don't think it would be here now. So uh, just to prove how lucky we were. Uh, I think you all know what luck meant during the time that you were out there. Thank you. That's all. Uh, gentlemen on the left. Something seems to be wrong with the microphone. Wally Paul, 398 Bronze Room, XDOW. Oh, I, uh, I was in a uh, prison hospital, Appledorn, Holland. There was an escape out of there, which I'm familiar with. Uh, I frankly assisted two English flyers, one American flyer. This occurred the last part of January 1945. I'm wondering what source I can go to or if there's anything I can find out about the success or the failure of that three-man escape. Is there any member of the panel who can answer that? I think yeah, that let, me, let me just take one pass, and that is, if you are able to give us a name, then we can determine whether or not they successfully evaded. And if they did, perhaps we can go from there to help answer your question. 
but we can't do it in just this minute of time. But if you'll contact me and can give me a name, uh, incidentally, why you just really given me the opportunity? They see before every behind every good man is a better woman. I'm going to ask my wife to stand up. She happens to have written four or five thousand letters to have most of our 900 plus membership, and she probably has more knowledge up here about evasions and the people involved than anybody in the audience in spite of all the work that these women back here did. If you have a question, sir, would you like to go to the microphone? Uh, there's, there's one here. My name's Art Hawley. We're back in business here. Uh, I'd like to know, is that list going to be published and available to other members of the agency? Number two, Bobby, will you please help us with how you got captured? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, I was waiting at the station, the North Station in Brussels, for the Dutch passer the, the, uh, to, to bring uh, uh, one or two airmen over um, from Holland and to take them. And uh, he was apparently already, this passer was already taken, taken in Eurasia, in Marine, Mechelen. And, um, when he came, he, he came with a Gestapo man in, in overalls, and of course, uh, it was very difficult to find clothing for them, so they, they, they usually had farm clothing on, I mean, what the farmers had uh, 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 available for them, or, and so on. So I thought, and he didn't give me a sign, the pasteur didn't give me a sign or anything, and I was waiting outside of the, of the, uh, the uh, uh, what, what do you call it, uh, uh, platform, uh, thing. and uh, all of a sudden they came out and I saw a revolver under my nose and uh, had a book. And so I was standing there and uh, then I was taken to, to Antwerp and was uh, inter uh, interrogated there uh, for, for the night. And then I was brought to the uh, uh, barracks of the Chateau de Laken and I stayed there for about fully two months. And then uh, uh, I was I went to the prison of Saint Gilles in Brussels, and from there, eventually, after having been condemned to death, I was uh, uh, transported to Germany, uh, where I went to several prisons, and I was liberated by the Russians, which I'm still very grateful for for always. <laughs> Thank you, Charlotte. Yes, sir. I'm Charles Henry. I was with the 8th Air Force. I shot down my 5th Nation. Uh, found out later it was near uh, AWOL. My first interrogation was in Charroy. Then I was later uh, sent to Brussels, <laughs> Belgium, interrogated, and then said no. But today, I don't understand why they signed the Geneva Convention and they did not tell them. We were forgotten people. I know the Belgian underground tried to get to me immediately. In fact, they were with me before I was captured. They had taken off. And they had told me, and it was, it was just about five minutes after I had uh, gotten out my parachute and uh, got my GI boots on that the Germans had picked me up, and that was at Awali, Southern Belgium. I was born in Holland myself, so I had, uh, in, in a way, I had a double nationality. Um, I was very much against the Nazis, and which you can understand. And when I see what is happening now in Germany, I must say that I am very, very, very frightened. 
And I hope that something can be done against it, that the German government will do something in order to quell the, the new uprising of the Nazis there. Thank you, Shannon. Us, how we think about the Germans now. I was telling you a little while ago how lucky we were sometimes and how I lucked that day. But five days before the war ended, my luck ran out too when I was arrested by the Gestapo by the name of a guy by the name of Cunard, who later escaped to Paraguay, but otherwise he would have been sentenced to death. He was a Gestapo guy. And they beat the hell out of me for five days every three hours. Uh, they wanted to know where we had the weapons hidden because they were afraid that when it was all over that we would kill as many as them uh, as we could. Anyway, I didn't tell them where the weapons were and that's why they keep beating me. So, uh, the last day I was transported to a jail in Utrecht and I thought I was going to be shot there. 